Hello and welcome to 3 Cycle Strength, the show for strength and conditioning coaches who are serious about getting better and giving back. My name is Adam Reed and I'm the host of this program. You may know me from my work as the managing editor of CSCCA Magazine or the CSCCA Monthly Email Newsletter. Uh, I'm also an editor for AFCA Magazine and AFCAinsider.com. This show is specifically for strength and conditioning coaches. We're going to be bringing you brand new episodes every Wednesday with some of the top strength and conditioning coaches in the world, as well as other experts who are relevant to the field of athletic performance. We have an awesome list of initial guests already lined up, so make sure that you don't miss a single episode. Now, before we get to today's guest, allow me to share some of the goals, some of the motivation for the show with you. The biggest goal for the show just so happens to coincide with the biggest reason why you should be checking us out every week, and that is that we are going to bring you the content that's going to help make you a better strength and conditioning coach, period. Our next goal is bringing you great products and services information. That doesn't mean that we're going to be jamming this thing full of ads, but we want to make sure that you're getting reliable information from your peers about what they're using on a day-to-day basis and also bringing on a supplier from time to time and letting them share their perspective as well. Lastly, and most importantly, we want to have an ongoing conversation with the strength and conditioning community. We want to foster an environment where you're sharing ideas, and to do that, we need your feedback, email, social media, YouTube comments, whatever it might be. Make sure that you are engaging with us because this will only be as good as the participation that we receive from you. Today's episode, we take a little stroll down memory lane with Coach Mad Dog Madden. He is a true pioneer in the field of strength and conditioning. He's been doing it for almost 40 years. He gave us some inside scoop on why he got started in the profession in the first place, uh, the significance of his nickname, why he listens to Prince while he's doing the bench press, and a whole bunch of other stuff that I think you guys are really going to enjoy. Before we get to the interview, I have to remind you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit that notification bell. That's going to be the number one way to make sure that you don't miss any of our new releases. And if audio is more your speed, we're available pretty much anywhere where you get your podcasts, so make sure you're subscribed there as well. With that being said, let's get into our conversation with Coach Madden. Our guest today is the type of individual who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. He's a Hall of Fame coach who's coached a lot of Hall of Fame players. He's coached individuals who've had successful careers in athletics at virtually every single level and in every single endeavor that you can possibly imagine, from the NFL, the NBA, the MLB, Olympics, MMA fighters, pro wrestlers, our country's special forces, you name it, he's coached them. He's a 2003 inductee into the USA Strength and Conditioning Coaches Hall of Fame. He trained athletes at UNC, Colorado, Cincinnati, and Rice, and spent over two decades with Mac Brown at the University of Texas. He is a founding member of the CSCCA and served as their president from 2009 until 2016, and he's still on their board of directors as a special advisor And as if that resume wasn't intimidating enough, the man's nickname is Mad Dog. It's Coach Jeff Madden joining us today on 3 Cycle Strength. How are you, Coach? Doing great. How about yourself, Adam? I'm doing fantastic. Hey, I got to know right off the bat, how in the world does somebody get a nickname like Mad Dog? Well, I'll tell you what, my my dad was a Marine, like yourself, no, and he... uh, he worked me hard. I mean, I got up every morning and, you know, did my push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, and dips and made sure my bed was made and those four corners were popped. So, I mean, it, it uh, I just learned that lifestyle as I grew up. He always said you wanted to be like steel wrapped in cotton. You know, mm-hmm. so you have the warm interior and the cold, hard exterior. So what happened was when I started playing football, uh, my coaches said you got to be a boy dog you know, out there and I'm playing real tough and rough and doing good things. And then they said, well, you got to be a mad dog. You got to be like him. You got to be a mad dog. And kind of stuck from that point on. Obviously, uh, I I could see if your dad was a Marine, how that would, you know, kind of play a role because, you know, especially uh, your dad with the period of time that he must have been in the service, uh, you know, 
even a, a jarhead like me would have uh yeah definitely would have been a wake-up call even for somebody like me at, at the time that he was in because that was a, a different marine corps back then it was a different um, world yeah absolutely absolutely um you know i remember in one of our conversations not too long ago you were telling me that uh you were one of the first strength and conditioning coaches to really start using music uh in the weight room for uh you know for motivation and that sort of thing and so i have to ask you how we came from no music in the weight room to the importance of listening to prince while you're doing the bench press how did that happen <laughs> Ah, that's, that's a funny one. That's a, a funny transition to you, too. Uh, I tell you what, and I, I know who you got that from. You either got it from Ivy or you got it from... Uh... <laughs> oh, you, you can't make me fall on my sword of uh, journalistic integrity here, Coach. You know, I can't reveal there's my only, sources. There's only two guys that knew that story. So basically, uh, I'll tell you the Prince story. And the Prince was story was uh, they, they said that they were going to add uh, powerlifting to the Olympics. Okay, so we're talking about 1986 uh, or 87, somewhere around there. And uh, I'm training and working hard and getting ready. And, uh, you know, I was trying to catch up with Kazmar. Kazmar had just hit uh, 600, and then he went uh, 625. So I went 602 and uh, ended up wearing 622 as a necktie. But uh, <laughs> when you uh, – when Prince came on, you know, Doves Cry, that, that uh, touched home a little bit. You know, I, I watched how, uh, that movie that when it came out and I really got fired up about it. So I, I liked Prince and always enjoyed his music uh, and his intensity. And uh, our whole weight room used to rock when that Prince came on because they knew it was time for, you know, Mad Dog to get down there and do his thing. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Mad Dog doing his thing, we have a few clips from your website that I was hoping to get your commentary on. Here's a clip from August of 2013 of you firing up the troops at Texas. When you see clips like this, does it bring back memories? You know, does it give you that itch to get back in there with the guys? Well, there, there's no question. I have that itch daily. So, I mean, there. You know, you don't, you don't want to hang up your cleats. You never do. You want to hang your whistle. You know, you still want to be in the middle of it. Uh, this thing that you're seeing right now is from when we, uh, I introduced the, co the kids to Coach Brown and said, this is your whatever year team. You know, they trained hard, they worked hard, they passed all the tests and they're ready to go battle. So we just get kind of excited and those guys get excited and get up and get after it. So, you know, but we, we, we break it down to do those kind of things and, and have fun doing it. That's, you got to have fun. You're working Absolutely. with kids that are 17 to 23 years old. You know, they're kids. You know, people want to say, yeah, they're men. They're No, they're kids in men's bodies. You know, so you got to make sure you're giving them a great experience and an opportunity to be kids and have fun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, life is short, right? You have to keep that in mind. You know, kids deserve to enjoy their experience. This next clip is one of the greatest moments. Forget Longhorn history. This is one of the greatest moments in all of sports history. Fourth and five, the national championship on the line right here. And I'm assuming that you were on the sidelines for this one, Coach? I think I was on the field when it happened. <laughs> <laughs> you took the field? I think I had stepped there, on the field on. a little bit to make sure. No, I, I'm, yeah, I'm on the side, of the and, and I, I hold that corner down right in and make sure our coaches don't go beyond that point. But when when Vince hit the corner, I think uh, everybody was pretty much almost on that field. Uh, but it's so such an exciting time, uh, great for the young man. If you see him looking up to the heavens right there and you know thanking God for it, you know it's the same thing that we all had done. Sure. Right on. I mean, uh, it, that's one of those moments that, just as a sports fan, if you can't recognize that that's one of the greatest moments in all sports that you're ever going to see, that's why people are, are fans of the game, right. you know, for moments exactly. like that. That's what you live for. This is Mark Henry of pro wrestling fame at the 2002 Arnold Strongman Classic. 
Yeah. Right, we're all strong. And who is this wandering into the frame? Giving him a little something something for that last rep. And he may not have put the whole team on his back like Vince Young did in that national championship game, but that is a tremendous amount of weight that he's throwing up there. 366 pounds, I believe. Tell me about uh, this experience, Coach. What what uh, what was going on here? Well, you remember now, there's only been a, a few humans, I think two or three humans that ever lifted up all the wheels once. And Mark did it three times. You know, so that was, that little extra boost was for that third rep. You know, one thing about Mark Kearney, he's a tremendous competitor. You know, he and when you talk about athlete, he's one of the best athletes I've had the opportunity to coach. He could jump on a six foot box from six feet away from the box, two foot jump, and explode at that was like at 420 pounds. That type of explosion. He could go on a basketball court and 360 dunk at the same weight. You know, so I mean, he had tremendous explosion. I put him down in football drills. And I think people would be kind of happy he wasn't on the football field because he was so explosive and so powerful, you know. But uh, what I do is mimic the things that he did, did in the wrestling ring with weights and resistance. And when we got out there, we had practiced for so long to win that championship. And I'm so proud of him because he, he brought home the trophy. He brought home the uh, – the big SUV and a couple big checks. So he was really happy. We were really happy, you know, and uh, the goal was accomplished and he represented all of us at that given time. The last thing for you here, um, you know, you were talking about those young bucks. There they are. I know they weren't as young as probably the first time you met them. In fact, I think here you're talking about how young they were when you first came across uh, these individuals. But when you see, let me just pause it right here. When, when you see that group of individuals and think about where they're at and their careers today, I'm sure it doesn't surprise you, uh, you know, that, that they've made it to, you know, kind of be this next wave of, of leadership for the, the profession. And that's, that's part of the reason I, I laid my hand on them to try to continue to keep the profession going and, 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 you know, pass the torch, you know, for those guys to let them understand how powerful they will be in the future. But they, they'll they tell you too, you know, not only was I good to them, not only did I, I, I love them, I just also had a tough love for them, you know. And if I, if I saw something that wasn't right or if they didn't answer something the way it was supposed to be, I'd let them know and then they would correct it, you know. And, and those guys are, you know, those guys are unbelievable. And uh, they're doing tremendous jobs out here. Uh, helping athletes now and my message even though I, as I was standing there I was thanking you know the guys before me and the coaches before me that taught me uh, the right way you know and and that way it would carry on and now when they get up and they do their speeches sometimes I, I hear people telling me that yes well Mad Dog they mentioned you and they said this about you and you know how much they you helped them and you, you want to make make the ground more fertile than it was when you got here you want to leave a lever a lasting legacy uh for people uh and and i think that's what i'm trying to do and i'm continuing to try to do that you know and give the guys my best you're watching three cycle strength make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so as i was saying a little bit earlier you know if, if coaches today walked into the weight room when you were first starting out I feel like a lot of them would probably think that they had walked into a weight room on the moon. Uh, it has changed so much since you got started. And, you know, over those years, I'm sure that you've seen a lot change, no question. But, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? And so I'm wondering, today I, I was really hoping to kind of pick your brain about the things that over the years – have stood the test of time. But, but before we do that, I, I'd like you to try and paint a picture for our audience about you know what the weight room looked like, what the profession looked like when you were first starting out. Okay, I'll, I'll let you see how that was. First and foremost, we were trying to create a profession. 
you know, because there, there weren't a lot of strength coaches. Uh, now we're talking about 1979. Uh, so there weren't a whole lot of strength coaches in the country. I mean, Boyd Epley was there. Uh, I was told when I became a strength coach to look up some guys, Bruno Paletto at Tennessee, Dana LaDuke at Texas, uh, Boyd Epley. Uh, there were maybe two others uh, that had <clears throat> pretty much started the foundation of strength and conditioning and looked those guys up and learned from them. And that's what I did. I went out and I, I went I went to people's places, uh, told them who I was. I mean, we didn't have cell phones back then. We didn't have pagers. You know, we didn't have anything. We just had a phone with a rotary dial on it. And we call and try to set something up. Some guys will let you in, other guys wouldn't. You know, because some guys thought that what they knew was a secret and they were going to keep it to themselves to help their teams get better. You know, then the uh, NSCA came out. Uh, I want to say I joined the NSCA in 82. Yeah, 1982 or 82. Yeah. And uh, from that point, you know, information was being shared a little bit more. Uh, that uh, organization grew to be a very large organization. And we, as uh, strength and conditioning coaches, and 20 years ago, uh, started the CSCCA for collegiate strength and conditioning coaches only. You know, because what happened was that other organization got so big that the college coach and the strength coaches were kind of pushed out, of, pushed aside, and it was a secondary situation. So you had you had trainers, you had gym owners, you had, uh, you know, folks that uh, weekend warriors, you know, that have become part of that organization. And it was not totally set on strength and conditioning like it had been in the past, you know. So from there, you know, when Boyd Epley was one of the guys who started that one and he was one of the guys that helped start this one. Uh, and he, he came to me and asked me to join and be part of it and be on the board, and I did. And uh, we did a great job. I mean, it, for 20 years in, uh, we, we made an organization that a lot of folks thought that we couldn't make it because we had no money, you know, but we did have great strength coaches that uh, believed in each other and shared information and that embraced young kids and taught them how to do it. We set up internship programs. Uh, and I know Donnie May uh, was my guy at Texas that handled the intern programs. And we'd have 10 interns every semester. So if you think about it now, I was there a long time, you know, 17 years, you know, so we started those programs in I think 2001. So I had a lot of people go through those programs that are now running uh, strength conditioning programs here in the United States and in uh, China and some other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Certainly, you know, coaching as a profession in general, not just strength and conditioning, but, you know, any kind of coaching, uh, it's often about, you know, your coaching tree and where you came from, you know, uh, at, which, you know, speaks to kind of the idea of networking and, and relationship building and, and how important that really is. Because ultimately, and I'm sure this is probably one of those things that stood the test of time for you, uh, ultimately you can be a great strength and conditioning coach, but you need somebody to give you an opportunity and you always need somebody to kind of, you know, give you a nudge and, and point you in the right direction from time to time. Have, have you found that to be your experience? No, no question. You, you need an opportunity. You know, you have, need opportunity to show your skills. You need opportunity to uh, be in that situation. We talked about weight rooms and what they used to look like and what they look like now. I forgot to say something about that. But when you look at a weight room from the 70s, you see universal machines, you see knowledge machines, uh, you might see some dumbbells. Uh, everybody had a, a, a bench press, a squat rack, and a clean area. But they were normally 3,000 to 7,500 square feet, you know, not, not giant places. Uh, when you look at some of these monstrosities they're building now, you know, you see 25,000 square feet minimum on some of them, and then they just keep growing. You know, uh, as far as equipment that's in them, uh, and you talked about uh, Texas earlier, I mean, 
you're, you're in a situation where, you know, you have great equipment. You can get whatever you want. You can do whatever deal you want to do with the different equipment companies to have them build whatever your imagination is or whatever your mind frame is. What you got to understand is as you change strength cultures, you change strength equipment. You know, so the university mm -hmm. knows that, you know, because different people have different philosophies. So you have to make sure you have everything that they need uh, to get the job done. I've also helped a lot of the uh, historically uh, black universities try to get them equipment and that kind of stuff over the years. And also, you have to do the best job you have with whatever you have. Um, I was at uh, Rice, Rice University for five and a half years. Uh, I was at Cincinnati. He's even better. I was at the University of Cincinnati in 1983. And we had a universal machine. We had some old uh, Joe Weider weights, uh, you know, the little ones, the one with the little hole, <laughs> you know, and we made the best out of that, but we did a whole lot of body weight workouts. You know, we did a whole lot of things that, uh, you know, made you strong and we want, we want some games, you know, but now if you go to that same place, you'll see a beautiful facility, you know, so it's important now. It's tremendously important because you are the person that's the liaison with the players and the coaches. You know, so you're the one that's delivering the message, getting the head coach's message across to the players. In some areas, you are the disciplinarian. You know, in some places, you're the the daddy, the uncle, the, the big brother, you know, whatever they're missing in their family that they need, you're that person, or you're not. I mean, and then they play hard for you if you are. You know, if, if you're not, you're not going to be as successful. Mm -hmm. You know, going back to what you said about uh, you know, doing the best with what you have. Uh, I know we've talked about this before, um, you know, for other things, you know, not related to this show, um, you know, whether it was CSCCA magazine or it might have been uh, for an article that we did in uh, the AFCA magazine. But I, I remember you telling me that, you know, it's easy for strength and conditioning coaches to get caught up worrying about, you know, having the best stuff and, and keeping up with, you know, the program uh, across the state or, you know, in the conference that uh, they feel like, you know, has all the, the things that they want and, and getting jealous of that and forgetting their responsibility to focus on, you know, the, the players, the athletes that they have and just do their best every day. Uh, and I know that it's really easy to do that, you know, even even in my own personal life, you know, with, with anything, it's, it's, it's easy to, to get caught up in thinking about, you know, you know, daydreaming about the things that you don't have instead of making what you do have better. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't know that we can reinforce that too much with coaches, right? I mean, that's that's a, one of those principles that, that has to be true, you know, regardless of what you're doing and regardless of, you know, how far we get into this profession. Right. The bottom line is you have to do the best job that you possibly can do wherever you are with whatever you have, you know. And if you don't have something, make it, invent it. I mean, we, I, I remember in the rice days, we used to have bake sales. You know, we used to have, uh, you know, my wife would cook and, you know, we go out there and sell whatever that we needed to sell to get money to buy equipment. We had guys that went on to the NFL or guys that were successful in business that donated back to the university that bought us a treadmill. We have a ceremony. Somebody will buy one treadmill, we'd have a ceremony for them. You know, so that tells you how much, how far it's gone from right. then. You know, whereas to when, you know, I was blessed and fortunate that, I had Dr. Nasser Al-Rashid at, uh, at the University of Texas that told me you will never want for anything. Whatever you need for this program, you can get it, you know, and it was a tremendous man, tremendous Longhorn, you know, and he did everything he could to make sure we had whatever we needed to be successful in that strength and conditioning department, you know. So you get people like that. I mean, Boyd Epley had a guy at Nebraska I mean, several of these other guys, Clemson and other places, they have joy in those guys. They have guys or ladies, uh, families that, you know, the, the weight rooms are named after the family, you know, and they make sure that weight room is nice. I mean, Dominic and Sue came into Nebraska and uh, built a tremendous facility in Nebraska. Same thing at uh, USC now. Uh, they have a tremendous weight room. Yes, sir. Um you know, and it, it's like you said, it's becoming more and more common, even at the high school level. 
to to have that that type of of equipment you know I, I wanted to shift gears and ask you about kind of um from a programming standpoint what has stood the test of time for you because I know that coaches have a tendency to especially when they're first figuring out what their philosophy looks like when it comes to programming they have a tendency to kind of move too fast from one thing to another right they 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 try something for a year they don't get the results they want and they're ready to just rip it all up and throw it away and try something else and so I'm wondering if there's any any themes that you've seen you know things that you can always go back to that could help coaches you know with trying to figure out you know what it is that's going to work for them in their career yeah well you know when, when you say guys uh run a program for a year then they throw it away uh tear it up and go do something else i mean it, it, it's you have to believe in something or you fall for anything i mean that's that's a blatant statement you you have to believe so if you have something that's solid and then you know that it's worked elsewhere or it's worked for other people you know you go to all the different conferences and clinics and you learn you spend time talking to coaches that have been through it and you see exactly where you failed at that particular program, you know, so you don't throw the whole thing away. First of all, you know, the weights are still the same weight that they were 60 years ago. I mean, if it's a 45 is a 45, you know, a 50 pound weight is a 50 pound weight, 25 is the same. So, I mean, you can have different weights. Now, what I, what I always tell people is, you know, uh, young guys, I could write three sets of 10 of every exercise that we do on the board and we beat the majority of the people that we play. Why is that? Because the kids believe not only in your program, they believe in you. Programs should be written for the level of athlete that you have. You know, who, whomever that athlete that you have, and not just the team, but I mean the individual athletes. You know, you have to program to that you know, then you'll be successful, you know, because if you, if you try to give a defensive back the same program you did with the defensive lineman and he's got the same loads, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You know, if you're trying to give one of your tennis athletes the same thing you gave that same defensive back, tackle, you're going to fail. You know, so, I mean, you, you have to figure out the movement of the sport, the movement of the athlete at that particular position, you know, and then figure out what his loads can be, you know, because when guys come out of high school, they can say, oh, yeah, coach, I, I bench 500, I, I squat 600, I do all that, but you haven't tested him and you hadn't seen him do it, you know, so therefore, he may be doing it at two inches, you know, he may take the bar off and just go down just a little bit and boom, he calls up a squat, you know, and you can't put your athletes in poor positions like that you have to start from the basics. So we start every one of them off with a wooden dial, you know, and they have to show us the range of motion that they go through. Then we have a bar. We have to move up to a bar. And then if they're real proficient, proficient with a bar after a while, we'll go into the basic movements of every exercise. And then we'll add, you know, a, a 45 pound weight on it. Now all this for some people can take two, three days. Other guys, it takes a lot longer because they have poor mechanics. If you're not, you got to work on the mechanics because if you don't, you got problems that are going to come down the road. You know, guys are going to, you know, pull something, hurt something, tear something, you know, uh, because they're trying to keep up with the guy next to them. And so there's a whole lot of competition in weight rooms too. So you got to be aware and alert of all that kind of stuff. It's interesting that you say that about, you know, running the risk of, of injury because that's another thing that I feel like uh, strength and conditioning coaches have taken very seriously from the very beginning. Uh, not that we haven't gotten better, hopefully, about it, but, you know, athlete safety, it, it gets hit up so often now to the point where sometimes it gets tuned out because we are so conscious about it. And, you know, I, I've always said that you know, safety first is not a cliche. Safety first is not something that you should say, you know, as a joke in passing, because safety first is really family first. You know, these are, and I, I know that 
you know, from conversations we've had that you feel the same way. These are family members that, you know, whether or not you feel that way personally, they're somebody's family that you're training. You know, they're, these are brothers and sons and cousins and aunts and uncles. And so, you know, rem- remembering that, you know, no matter where you're at in your career, you're, you're never, you've never arrived to the point where you can't be thinking about safety. And even if you're just starting out, you still need to be conscious about safety. It's everybody's job to take care of these athletes and make sure that, you know, that you're safeguarding their health. Right. And, and the bottom line to all that you just said, you know, is these kids are extremely important to us. They're somebody's child. You know, every time you say something to somebody, imagine what it would be like if they said it to your child. I mean, because some of the things that you hear people say to these athletes, you know, if somebody would have said it to your child or my child, we'd have been been a figure four leg lock. And I, I would have been a jujitsu ju- ju- champion in, <laughs> you know, with some of these coaches. You know, but the bottom line is these kids have feelings and emotions. They're in positions where they're you're building their livelihood. So basically, you're molding somebody else's child. So make sure you're doing it in a positive manner. You know, you can you can break them down, but you better damn sure build them back up after you break them down. You know, and just make sure you're not trying to make a reputation off of these kids. You know, the only reputation you want to have is somebody that cares and somebody that's teaching them how to win and how to be the best they possibly can be because these kids are our future. You're watching Three Cycle Strength. Do you have a great idea for a topic or a guest on the show? Shoot us an email, team at threecyclestrength.com. Let's jump ahead to strength stories, the stories that forged who we are. This is quickly becoming one of my favorite segments. It's an opportunity for coaches to share a little of themselves talk about the things that really shaped them and molded them. Coach Madden, I know that you have seen a multitude of changes. You've lived through a lot. You've seen things grow and evolve over the years. There are probably a thousand different stories that you could tell us. Wondering if there are one or two things that really stick out to you, experiences, interactions, whether it was with an athlete, with a mentor, something that uh, really shaped your career had a profound impact on the strength and conditioning coach that you became? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll even go a little deeper. I'll tell you why I went this route, you know, to get in the strength and conditioning profession. You know, I had a guy by the name of Doc Kreese that came into uh, Vanderbilt University when I was playing. And uh, Doc had some key things. He had, he had the mayor that came in there to work out with us. He had the governor. He had uh, several police officers and that kind of thing. He had who's who of Nashville, Tennessee that came there in the weight room. He was able to go and eat at any restaurant that he wanted to. He wore shorts to work every single day. They gave him a free Jeep to drive and he had a free apartment right on campus. So when I was trying to make up my mind what I wanted to do, you know, we're not being in the pros. I said, I kind of like that job. You know, I, I could see myself doing that, you know, because there, everything, he, he was, he was a big guy, big time guy in Nashville, Tennessee. Everybody knew who he was, you know, and what I, what I understand is he would have uh power lifting contest where people from all over the world would come in and train there at the music city invitation. I got to lifting it myself, you know, but he had who's who, of strength and conditioning in there. So when I saw him and watched him on a regular basis, I was one, I was in his hip pocket learning everything I could, you know, to do this profession. So that's why I became strength and conditioning coach. Because I saw you could help kids and make a tremendous impact on them. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk a little bit about products and services, shall we? I know that you're the type of coach that others really look up to. Obviously, when you speak, young coaches listen. And so I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on the tools of the trade. There are two things that I'd ask you to share with us. One, what are the pieces of equipment that you feel like have stood the test of time and you know the companies that have stood the test of time? And also, 
what are the toys over the years that you've been able to play with that you just couldn't believe? Like, wow, I really get to play with this? I, I think every day I walked into that weight room at Texas and North Carolina and Colorado, I felt as though I can't believe I get to work here. You know, because we, we had so many nice, wonderful toys, as you say, you know, things to make you better. You know, since I've been out, I have even more respect for it because now you have to go back the other way and start taking boards and screws and, and doing different things to try to invent stuff and make stuff for, to makeshift it for your athletes. So when, when you say the tools of the trade, uh, there are so many great equipment companies out there. I mean, these guys are doing it. I mean, you know, you got Samson's out there doing it strongly. Um, you know, I think about folks that are doing a great job for us, like uh, Sorenex equipment, uh, Samson equipment, Hammer Strength Fitness, Life Fitness. Uh, you know, uh, they're all great. I mean, there's people will make what you want now. You know, if you're if you got a good enough program and you got enough money, they'll make exactly what you need for your athletes. And that's one thing I really like about the majority of the companies and the ones I just talked about. Uh, we had a, a guy out of Oklahoma that made a, something called a tub. And the tub was just a piece of uh, plastic water with water in it. And it was a tremendous competition equipment. Uh, anything that's going to create competition in a, in a competition environment is something that I really like. I mean, you got uh, the Samson dumbbells, you know, he, he I, I brought my first set of Samson dumbbells and 84 and had them all the way to 2017 you know so i mean you know if one broke he replaced it you know so those guys uh do phenomenal work uh there's a lot of other ones out there i don't, I don't want to miss anybody you know but there are some phenomenal companies that are doing great things well we could certainly talk to you all day about the ridiculous number of different pieces of equipment that you've used and the different companies that you've formed relationships with over the years. But let's move on to our last segment. I know that you're a busy guy. you got things to do. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition. We know that sports nutritionists, sports dietitians are becoming more and more popular these days. And, you know, the information is getting out there. But, you know, you have a unique perspective because you've seen things change and you've seen them come to prominence over the years. So, uh, you know, I guess I'm just curious, what is your encouragement to coaches to kind of, you know, take advantage of those resources that weren't available for you when you got started? Well, first of all, I understand that, you know, for many, many years we had to do it all and, and there was nobody else to do it but us uh, as strength and conditioning coaches. Also understand that it took 10 years at Texas for me to be able to get a dietitian to take care of everything for us. Uh, and we ended up hiring uh, Amy Culp as our dietitian. Uh, we had Leslie Bonsi, who was the uh, sister-in-law of our uh, women's trainer, who uh, came in maybe two to three times a year and met with the guys and girls. And so that was way too many people for her, you know, 500 athletes, uh, you know, to meet with just a couple of days out of the year, you know, but she did a tremendous job, you know, so that let me understand the value of what a uh, dietitian could bring to your program and how important nutrition is to your program. You know, the other thing is, you know, you don't want the nutrition of someone that's working in a hospital that's dealing with sick patients all the time because these athletes eat a tremendous amount of food, you know, and they eat a tremendous amount of calories. So you got to have somebody that totally understands what their nutritional needs are and how much they burn up on a consistent basis. Um, I'm learning more and more as time continues to go on of how important the nutritionist is, you know, so if you're a strength and conditioning coach, I would say get online, take a course in nutrition. Uh, you know, I think even now when it, with their strength and conditioning, they have strength and conditioning uh, majors now, and they're teaching nutrition in those majors. So, I mean, take those courses and that kind of stuff because the athletes are going to want to know. The internet is your best and worst friend. 
I mean, sometimes it's your best friend, but sometimes it's your worst friend because the guys are on that thing 24 hours a day when they're not practicing and they're trying to find something new and something different. So they'll have plenty of questions for you. You know, everything about supplementation, uh, you need to be abreast on the majority of the things that are out there and have an understanding of what amino acids do and the different type of uh, protein powders or which one's best for what athlete, you know, you have to know that stuff, you know, because when you're in the middle of the job and a kid asks you a question or their parents ask you a question, or you get asked a question while you're in the middle of a session with recruits, you have to know. Well, I, I really appreciate your perspective, coach Madden. And I appreciate all the time, obviously that you've given us today. I hope that coaches will, listen to this, uh, watch this, and really understand how fortunate they are to have a profession that caters to them in so many ways, to have information available to them at, you know, the touch of a button uh, a couple clicks away. And uh, I think that you're the type of individual who has blazed a trail for so many people. And so I want to thank you personally, you know, I wouldn't be able to do what I do, but also, you know, for all of our audience members, uh, you know, having you on the show, having your perspective uh, means a lot. And I know that they're going to get a lot out of it. So thank you very much for spending time with us here today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Coach Madden and everything he's got going on, visit maddogmadden.com. Uh, of course, you can reach out to him there as well. And Coach, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. No problem. Good luck with it. Hey everyone, just a quick reminder that 3Cycle Strength is stronger with your feedback and input. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at 3Cycle Strength, or shoot us an email at team at 3CycleStrength.com. I feel like we were in the presence of greatness today. There's one takeaway that I have from the conversation with Coach Madden. It's the love that he has for training athletes. Uh, not just training them, of course, but mentoring them, watching them grow and get better and you know, become not just better athletes, but better people. And I think that you can tell from the way that he, you know, spoke fondly about his memories of being in the weight room, about how much he misses being in the middle of the athletes, uh, just how much it means to him. And I know that coaches right now are struggling because of this whole pandemic and not being able to have that face-to-face -face time with athletes. So hopefully this will be a nice reminder to not take that for granted. And when this does end, and it will, to go back and really love these athletes and care for them and rededicate yourself to being a role model and a mentor for your athletes. It's time now for Kilograms, the segment where we're shining a light on coaches who are killing it on Instagram. And this week's kilogram comes to us from Simsbury High School in Connecticut. Their strength and conditioning coach, Tyler English, is of course the state director for the NHSSCA there in Connecticut. And check out this young man putting in some work. Of course, this is right before all of this pandemic madness hit us. He's all fired up and I love this commenter that scream though that, that captures that pretty much sums up my thoughts on this particular clip and uh we just wanted to give a shout out to coach english awesome job can't wait to see you guys back in the weight room again i wonder what that young man's reaction would be when i say the word coronavirus ah! yeah mine too that's it for this episode of three cycle strength uh, if you like the show, help us grow. Share it with your friends. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. I cannot stress that enough on YouTube, on the podcasting service. Uh, make sure that you're following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at 3 Cycle Strength. Like the videos. Drop us a comment. Shoot us an email at team at 3 cyclestrengthcom to keep the conversation going. And we've got some amazing guests coming up, so make sure that you are joining us for those as well. We've got Pat Ivey from Louisville, Mike Hill from Georgetown, just to name a couple. So make sure that you don't miss those. And until next time, stay humble and stay hungry.